It's great to be with you all this morning. Uh, it's really good to be up here. This is the first time that I've preached in front of people in a long, long, long time. And uh, it's good to see your smiling faces. And uh, we're in a new series, as Pastor Jeff mentioned, titled Forward. And uh, we're going to be looking at James chapter 1. So if you've got your Bibles, go ahead and turn there. The last four months have been pretty surreal in many ways from pretty much a global shutdown to what feels in many ways like a more divided country now than I've ever seen or known. I think that a lot of changes have taken place, but I think that this world and this earth and our nation is desperately in need of uh, a change. And the change that we all need is a heavenly change. And I think that people are searching for a heavenly change, and whether they realize that or not, that is what's needed. I'm reminded when Jesus was teaching his disciples how to pray, he said, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, right? Jesus' ministry revolved around bringing in and ushering in the kingdom of God here on earth. Where there was pain, he brought healing. Where there was shame, he brought freedom. Where there was brokenness, he brought restoration. Jesus was actively bringing heaven to earth in the way that he taught, in the conversations that he had, in the miracles that he performed, in the healings that he did. His whole ministry revolved around bringing more of heaven down to earth. And the wonderful thing for us this morning is that God has invited us to join him in this work. It's the holiest of all works that you can do, and that's ushering in the kingdom of God. You as a believer and a believer that is empowered by the Holy Spirit have the responsibility and the calling on your life to usher in a spirit of forgiveness. We are called to usher in a spirit of peace. We are called to usher in a spirit of unity and a spirit of joy. We are ushering in the kingdom of God here on earth by the way that we live our lives. I want New Hope to be a place that mirrors heaven. I want this to be a little slice of heaven on earth. Let me ask you this question this morning. Do your prayers reflect prayers that usher in the kingdom of God, or do they just revolve around your family and those closest to you to protect them, to guide them? Or are we praying kingdom ushering in prayers? Are we giving God an opportunity to flex in the prayers that, that we pray? Are these big, bold prayers? Are we, we praying for our nation? Are we praying for radical change? Are we praying for a Holy Spirit revival in, their, in our hearts, in our neighborhoods, in our communities? What do your prayers look like this morning? We are responsible and have been invited to also usher in the kingdom of God. And I believe that a heavenly change here on earth starts with a personal change in our hearts. So let's take a look at James chapter 1. We'll be starting in verse 19. My dear brothers and sisters, James writes, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word planted in you which can save you. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for your word. Thank you for your word and your spirit that speak to our hearts and to our lives. And so we open up our hearts. We open up our minds for what you want to say to us this morning. I pray that you would speak through me and you would open up our ears that we would hear what you are calling us to this morning, and that we would be doers, that we would resp respond in obedience, God. We love you. We thank you for this word. Speak through me this morning. And everybody said, amen. 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 We see in our text that we just read that James is calling his church to action. He's calling his followers of Christ to not just hear, but to do. He says that hearers 
are deceived, but the obedient are blessed. This morning, you have the opportunity to step into a life of obedience. And I believe that for many of you here this morning, as I look around and I see your faces, we believe that we are operating in obedience. But I want to ask you this. Is there something else that God is calling you to be obedient in that you are failing to do so? Have you allowed the Word of God and the Holy Spirit to speak to the deepest parts of your heart? Because that is what we need. We need revival. We need to become the body of Christ and the bride of Christ that Jesus wants us to be. And we need the Word of God to do this. God has been speaking and will speak very, something very specific, I believe, to everyone here this morning. Are you ready and are you willing to listen and to respond? The title of my message this morning is The Man in the Mirror. And I want to highlight two necessary ingredients in how to examine your life. And then I'm going to share a couple stories that I have personally gone through that I hope will encourage you, inspire you, and challenge you to allow God to speak to you and to change you so that we might see heaven here on earth. When we allow God to challenge us through the Word of God, through His Spirit, it always leads to holiness. It will always result in us looking more like Christ, and that's exactly what we need this morning. But the truth is, is that a lot of times, I don't want God to speak to all areas of my heart. The truth is for me that, that I'm pretty comfortable where I'm at. I might look pretty good on paper. I might stack up pretty good to the person to my left or my right. But what we need this morning is for God to speak to the very inmost of who we are. And I'm asking that you would open up your ears and your hearts. He's calling us to another level of holiness. And it's not just me that he's calling me to. He's calling us. He's calling new hope. He's calling you. The first thing that helps us examine our lives is the Word of God. In our text today, James uses a comparison of the Word of God to being like a mirror. Now, how many know that unless you're at a carnival, mirrors don't lie, right? You look in the mirror, guess what? It's going to tell you what it's going to tell you, whether you like it or not. Now, I... Uh, try to make it a habit before I leave the house to look in the mirror. I, I, I check out my outward appearance, make sure I don't have any bats in the cave. I don't have any toothpaste in my beard. You know, I'm, I'm just trying to, to do my diligence and, and looking okay, at least presentable. But the mirror reveals a lot about my outward appearance. Now, how many of you guys have one of these in your bathroom, right? How many even know what, what this is? These things right here should be made illegal, Right? For those who don't know what this is, this is not just your average mirror. This is a mirror that's like five times the magnification of a normal mirror. Now, I walk by the mirror. I look in the general mirror. I'm like, hey, not too shabby, Austin. I look in one of these, and all sorts of nasty appears. I'm thinking, what's going on here? You know, my pores need exfoliated, and I did a face mask, and I need a detox, and I need this and that. You look at these things, and, and, and I have an opportunity when I look in the mirror when it reveals things to me, I have an opportunity in that moment to either address what needs to be fixed or I can ignore what needs to be fixed. And I'm here to tell you that the Word of God does the same thing in our life. It reveals things that we could not see without a mirror. I can't tell if I've got stuff in my teeth without a mirror. I can't tell if I've got a pimple somewhere, uh, you know, without a mirror. And the Word of God will reveal things that are in your life that you might be completely oblivious to in this moment. You may have lived your life for 70 years long, and there are still blind spots that you have. Let us not fall into the deception that we have arrived. We are so far from Christ, no matter how holy we are. We need the Spirit and the Word of God to reveal, in our, uh, uh, reveal our hearts. The Word of God is, is described as being a double-edged sword. It's also uh, described as being the living Word of God. When we read the Word of God, 
It is unlike any other literature that we have. There is literal power when we dive into the word of God. Our mind literally is re-hardwired as we read God's word. I want to ask you this this morning. Are you allowing the word of God to search your heart? Are you allowing the word of God to challenge your way of thinking? I think oftentimes the easy answer is, yeah, we do that. But really, did you open up your Bible since your Wednesday small group? Did you open up your Bible since last Sunday? Have you dug into the Word of God and allowed it to act as a mirror, revealing things that you need to see in your life? Let's get serious about getting into the Word of God. It acts as this double-edged sword, and, and it will reveal things that need to change, and then we have the decision and the opportunity to either respond to it or ignore it. Are you listening? Are you awake? Let's read the next verse in our main text today. It's James 1, 26. This is a very challenging verse. It says, Those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues, or I should say maybe this, that do not keep a tight rein on their fingers, deceive themselves, and their religion is worthless. This verse cuts. This verse is, is tough, man. Think about the way you joke. Think about the way you interact. Think about the words that you speak. We read a verse like this, and we see that if we don't keep a tight rein on our tongues, we're deceiving ourselves, and our religion is worthless. That's hard stuff. That's a hard pill to swallow as a Christian. But you know what? If we were to memorize this verse, if we were to dwell on it, if we were to allow this verse to just be printed into our minds and into our hearts. Maybe the next time we're tempted to lash out at someone and and choose someone out or use some choice words, the Spirit would bring this verse to life and we would resist the temptation to yell at someone. Or maybe you do have a weak moment and you choose some, some words and you lash out at a coworker. Maybe the Spirit would bring this verse back to mind and you'd have an opportunity to show humility And go back to that person and say, I was wrong. I'm sorry. I apologize. Would you forgive me? That is what the Word of God does in our life. We see Jesus combating Satan with the Word of God. Why is it that you and I as Christians, we think that we can do better than Christ and we don't need the Word of God to combat Satan? Are you kidding me? If anything, we need the Word of God ten times more than Jesus needed it. Help us, Jesus, to have the Word of God ingrained in our hearts. David in Psalms 119.11 says, I have hidden your Word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Hear me this morning. Getting the Word of God into your mind and your heart is essential for Christian living. It is absolutely essential for Christian living. Do you struggle with sinning? Do you struggle with knowing what's right and what's wrong? Get in the stinking word of God. There's power in it. It will transform your mind. You won't be just to be able to to see things as Christ, but you'll be able to have the heart of Christ. It's the number one tool that God has left us with is the written word of God. It's easy. It's right there. There's no discerning it. It's, It's in front of us. We have access to it. What are you filling your mind with? Do you, what do you read? Articles about politics, about the coronavirus, about sports, about this or that? Are you filling your heart and mind with the Word of God? I love how James describes this. He says the Word of God or, or the law is the perfect law that gives freedom. The perfect law that gives freedom. Now I find it interesting that God gave Moses, and stick with me for a second, That God gave Moses and the Israelites the Ten Commandments and all these written laws after he brought them to a place of freedom. The law wasn't meant to enslave them. The law was set up as a safeguard so that they could remain in a place of freedom that the Lord brought them to. Has anybody ever thought about that? They got the laws after they were delivered. They had been redeemed, and the means of the redemption was the blood of the Lamb that covered their doorposts. And this blood poured out uh, 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 for the redemption was a foreshadow of Jesus Christ pouring out his blood for us so that we too can be redeemed. But we see that the Lord gave the law not as a means of salvation, but as a lifestyle for those who have already been redeemed. For you and for I, we tend to view in today's society as the law and liberty as antagonists, right? Right? 
don't tell me what I can and cannot do. But however, when we abide by God's law, that's when we become free. Because we are living the way that God intended us to live, and therefore we're reflecting our Creator. Living in the will of God, which includes living under His law, is where we find true freedom. We're no longer a slave to sin. Have you allowed God's Word to refine your heart so that you can live free? God's law safeguards our freedom. Are you allowing God's word to speak to you, to challenge you, to change your way of thinking and the way that you view people and things and situations in life? Many of you know that I went to North Central for college, and uh, it's an Assembly of God school in Minneapolis, and, and it's in the heart of Minneapolis. We need to pray for Minneapolis. And uh, three blocks away from my dorm room was the Metrodome. It's now, I think, U.S. Bank Stadium where the Vikings play. Um, there's a park in the center of campus where all sorts of people from the community would come and the Somalians would come and play soccer there. And right next to my dorm was Hennepin County Hospital and ambulances at all hours of the day would come and go from Minneapolis. And I remember going as a freshman, as an 18-year-old, um, barely 18 years old, to, to Minneapolis and walking down the street. And for the first time in my life, I was a minority. I, I felt so out of place. I remember going into restaurants and going into businesses and just feeling uncomfortable. I remember walking down the street and if someone didn't look the way I looked or they dressed differently or they just looked uh, uh, different than I did, I would, I would tense up and I'd be nervous and I might put my pinky on my wallet, you know, just to kind of make sure. And I don't know what that was going to do, you know, it's like my wallet's just going to jump out of my pocket. But I remember just feeling so uncomfortable and so out of place. But the longer I lived in the city and the more interactions I had with the different people of that city, the more comfortable I grew with that city. And I remember reading in John's book where he has the revelations that God gave him. So the book of Revelations, I remember John painting this picture of heaven or being revealed this picture of heaven and he writes about heaven and he describes it as a place where, where every tribe and every nation uh, would be represented in, 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 in heaven. And I, I started thinking to myself, if that's what heaven is going to look like, then we've got some work to do here on earth because most of our churches don't represent that. I was and am challenged by the word of God to expand my level of comfort. Uh, if I'm going to spend eternity with people who look different and smell different and dress different and talk different than I do, then I want to get used to that on this side of heaven. I've got work to do. And it was the word of God that brought me to that understanding. It was revelation where every tribe and every nation and every tongue, I want new hope to reflect heaven. And if that's going to be the case, then maybe there's going to be a style of worship that's a little bit different a little bit more gospelly, a little bit more expressive. And, and I'm just sharing this morning what I feel like the Lord has challenged me and with, the, with what the Word of God. I feel like God has asked me to expand my circle, my natural circle of friends. I feel like God has asked me to go to other sides of town and try different restaurants of different ethnicities and, and to expand my my comfort level. I, I feel like I'm being led in these ways. I'm not telling you what to do this morning. What I'm doing is just simply sharing an experience that I have had. This is for me, but I'm asking you, would you allow the Word of God to challenge you and speak to you and lead you in whatever way that it's speaking to you? Would you join me in that which brings me to my second necessary ingredient. We need the Word of God, but the second ingredient to examining your heart is to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. See, the Holy Spirit and God's Word go hand in hand. They work together. We need the Spirit to quicken the Word to our, our hearts. John 3, 16, or excuse me, John 16, 13, uh, Jesus said uh, this. He said, when 
He, the Spirit of truth, comes. He will guide you into all truth. When the Spirit of truth comes, He will guide you into all truth. When the Holy Spirit comes, He's going to lead you in truth. Are you allowing the Holy Spirit to speak to your heart? Or are you dismissing Him? One of the most common questions that I, I get as a pastor is, Austin, I, I just, I don't know if God's speaking to me. I, I don't know how God is speaking to me. And you know what I tell them every single time someone asks me, how do I know to hear God's voice? How do I know if it's the Holy Spirit speaking to me? I tell them to get in the Word of God. Because what the Spirit speaks is never going to contradict what the Word speaks. If you feel like God is asking you to talk to someone, when was Whenever has, has talking to someone been a sin? You need to just talk to that person, right? Does it align with Scripture? Yeah. If you feel like God is, is prompting you to go on a mission trip, does that align with Scripture? Absolutely. Buy a stinking plane ticket or a boat ticket if you don't do flying pieces of metal and go on a, 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 a mission trip. You feel like God is leading you in a certain way to give something, to go somewhere, to change an occupation. Does it align with God's word? If it aligns with God's word, or at least it doesn't contradict it, then you can have confidence that it's the Spirit of God speaking to you. We need to stop being so, like, talked out of, is this the exact will of God? Is this exactly what He wants me to do? You know, I'm convinced of this. This isn't in my notes, but I'm convinced that one of the biggest issues with Christianity today is we get so wrapped up in this specific calling, you know, and we glamorize this calling. You know, we all have purpose and we all have, um, uh, I believe, callings, but sometimes God doesn't care how you make your money. He cares more about what you do with it and how you honor him with it. He doesn't care about if you work at McDonald's or Burger King. He just wants you to, to work there. And if you are willing and you're able to listen to his spirit, he will use you in either job setting. And, and so we get so consumed with knowing exactly where we're supposed to be. Is that wrong to ask God for specific directions? Absolutely not. But more times than not, God doesn't care if you drive a Ford or Chevy. God doesn't care if, if, you, if you do this or you do that. What he cares is that you are willing to obey him whenever he calls you by his spirit. And I think sometimes we dismiss or we don't allow the spirit of God to speak to us and to lead us because we're so afraid of making a mistake. I would rather be the Christian that goes out on a limb and if I feel like the Lord is leading me to do something, I'm going to talk to that person. If I feel like he's leading me to give something, I'm going to give that. And I'm going to err on the side of obedience and doing something than on, oh, I don't want to make the wrong decision. You guys hear what I'm saying? The Word of God acts as a test to see if what the Spirit is speaking to us is really God or not. Now, over the past several years, I feel that the Holy Spirit has changed my perspective with how I view the homeless community. I've likely said things such as, you know, they've made their own decisions, it's their fault. They chose drugs, they did this, they, they did that. They made their bed, they can lay in it. And while there might be some truth to those decisions, and there is an element of responsibility, what I feel like those statements and those types of statements do is they release me from a personal responsibility of having compassion or action for those individuals. And I remember pulling off the I-3580 Merle Hay exit headed southwest and seeing some homeless people. This was about a year ago. And I knew just down the road that there was, you know, a for hi or hiring sign, hiring now sign. And I, I wanted to just roll down my window and say, go get a job. Walk, walk a half a mile that way and put in your application, right? That's my flesh. That's what I wanted to say. But I knew that in that moment, I needed to have compassion. I didn't want to have a callous heart towards one of God's creations. 
And so I remember asking God, God, would you open up my eyes so that I might be able to see this individual the way that you see them. I need to have compassion, but right now I'm really struggling to have anything but just judgment and, and just do your own thing. You decided, you know, this is, this is America. You, you can get a job. And I'll never forget that he opened up my eyes. <laughs> and I began to see those people as five-year-olds. And I know that's really weird, and I know I'm getting emotional because I'm like my dad. <laughs> but I've got a five-year-old, a three-year-old, and a two-year-old at home. And I guarantee you right now, as Sam's probably finishing up breakfast, that he's not sitting at our dinner table thinking, I just can't wait to be homeless someday. At no point in a 12-year-old's life do they think, I just can't wait to get out of here and live under a bridge. I can't wait to be cold during wintertime and, and have no reprieve of the sun in summertime and to beg for each meal. Nobody in their right state of mind ever thinks, I can't wait to be homeless. See, there's a deception that's going on. There's, there's a mental block that's going on, and whether it's induced by drugs or some other substance, or it's, it's a, a bunch of lies that are being thrown at them from Satan that's holding them down in this situation, saying, you've made your mistakes, they won't have you. You're a reject, stay here. And whatever the reason is, it's besides the point. We need to see them as a child of God. If my Sam grew up and made bad decisions and it led to him being homeless, you can guarantee it that I would never stop loving him. I would never stop praying for him. I would never give up hope that whatever addiction or stronghold, whether it's a mental illness, whatever it might be, I would never give up hope that God could set him free of that mentality. Now, every time I see a homeless person, I pray for their mind. I pray that whatever lie is holding them down, that they would be released from it. I pray if there's any chemical addictions, that they would be freed from them. I pray for them as if they were my son or my daughter. I pray for their family members. Their grieved mom and dad. As a wayward son or daughter. I wouldn't have had that revelation without the Holy Spirit opening up my eyes. I believe that's how Christ sees us. Some of you guys have calloused views towards people. It might be a family member. It might be people that you have never met before. But we need the Holy Spirit to open up our eyes that we might see them as God's creation. And while there's responsibility that, of their choices and there's consequences for their choices, that doesn't mean that I can't look at them through the loving eyes of Christ and hurt and mourn and, and have compassion for them. We need the Word of God to change our minds and our perspectives, the way we look, the way we see, the way we think. We need a heavenly change here on earth. It starts with the Word of God, and we need a heavenly change here on earth, and it starts with allowing the Holy Spirit to convict us, to refine our hearts, to refine our way of thinking. As the musicians come, I end where I started. With Jesus' prayer, thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Seriously asking this question, what are you doing to usher in the kingdom of God? What have you done this week to usher in a spirit of unity, a spirit of peace, a spirit of joy, a spirit of forgiveness. Let me encourage you that the heavenly change that our society, 
our church, this community desperately needs. It starts with you. Through the word of God and through God's Holy Spirit. Would you stand and close your eyes? Bow your head. God is calling this church, His church. We're described as the beautiful bride of Christ. Are we a beautiful church? I believe in many ways we are. But when we hold up this mirror, I believe we've got some work to do. If you're here this morning and you feel as though you need God's help to become committed to reading God's word and you recognize that you need to spend more time in God's word so that you might look more like him with every eye closed and head bowed, would you just say, Austin, I've been lazy at getting in God's word. I want to have a more hunger of desire to be refined. Would you just raise your hand? I just want to pray for you in a moment. Yes, 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 yes. If you're here this morning, and you felt a nudge in your spirit where God has asked you to do something, but you've been running for that. Maybe, maybe you have been in your word, and, and God has put something that resonated in your spirit, and you've walked away from that, and you know that there's a change. Or maybe today you have felt like there needs to be a change in my attitude, in my heart, in my mind, and you recognize that the word of God and the spirit of God have been speaking to you, and it's time for you to obey what he's asking you to do. Would you just raise your hand and say, God has spoken something to me and I need his strength, I need his spirit, I need his power. Yes, yes, yes. And last, if you're here this morning and you'd say, Pastor Austin, I'm gonna join you in, in being open to what God is speaking to me through his word and his spirit. With God's help, I will be committed to doing everything I can to usher in God's kingdom here on earth. And you join me in that commitment this morning. Would you just raise both your hands towards heaven and repeat this prayer after me, but don't just repeat it as a mindless prayer, but make this your prayer. Internalize these words. Jesus, take my life, change my heart, and have your way. We want to see heaven here on earth. Help me hear your spirit. Help me spread your love and spread your word. Speak to me, God. Enable me to be obedient. Have your way in my life, and we invite your presence here on earth. In Jesus' name we pray. One last call I want to give. It's for anyone here who has never surrendered their life to Jesus Christ. You've never asked him to redeem you by the blood that he poured out on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins. I want to say that God loves you. He sees you. There's nothing that you've done that is too great for him to forgive. And you'd say this morning, Pastor Austin, I put my faith and my trust into Jesus Christ. Would you just raise your hand for the first time? I want to just be able to pray for, give opportunity for anyone to receive Christ as their Lord and Savior. Is anyone here? We're going to sing this song, More of Heaven. And my prayer is that when we sing this song, that we would genuinely cry out, does your heart break for this nation? Does your heart break for people? God, we make that our prayer. We recognize and we accept your call and your invitation for us to join you in the holiest of all works of bringing the kingdom of heaven here on earth. I pray that you would equip those that you have called. You'd give us courage 
and empower us with your Holy Spirit to do everything that you have asked us to do, Lord. I pray that there would be a spirit of humility. If there are things that are being brought to mind right now where we have wronged others, Lord, I pray that we would have a spirit of humility and we would step forward, we would ask for forgiveness. We would usher in a spirit of forgiveness. Help us, God. Help us be more like you. We want to see more of heaven here on earth. In Jesus' name, amen.